Welcome, everyone. My name is Maddie Buxton, and I'm the Culture and Trends Manager at YouTube. You might be wondering what YouTube is doing at this conference, um, and I don't blame you, but the reason that I'm here is that YouTube is seeing incredible growth of farming creators, both first-time farmers sharing their experiences and farmers whose families have been in the industry for decades, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. But first, a little bit of background. My team looks at what videos are popular on YouTube and tries to figure out why they're popular. One of the things that we work on is a program called Creator on the Rise, where we identify up and coming creators around the world. It's a place where we find a lot of trends in their early stages that go on to become huge. For example, last year we came across Pasta Grannies, a channel that features elderly Italian grandmothers teaching viewers how to make their favorite dishes. It became part of a larger trend of channels focused on preserving traditional family recipes. These grandmothers show that anyone can make a great YouTube post, no matter how much experience you have. And through Creator on the Rise, we've come across some more obscure trends, like calculator music. That was a version of Ed Sheeran's Shape of You, and it's been viewed over 5.9 million times. But late last year, we started to see a new kind of creator popping up in Creator on the Rise, farmers. First, there was Ollie, a farmer's son from Norfolk, England. Not long after Ollie came Sandy Brock, a sheep farmer from Canada whose Day in the Life video has been viewed over 230,000 times. In France, Creator on the Rise introduced us to Gael Blard, an organic farmer whose vlogs are accented by a very energetic soundtrack. In India, Kisan farming hit our radar, while in Indonesia, we found Putra Rimba vlogging about his life as a durian farmer. And right here in the U.S., we met Andy Detweiler, a farmer from Midwestern Ohio who lost both his arms in a childhood accident and uses his channel to show viewers how he farms using only his feet. This year, we've had more than 15 farming creator on the rises. And their growth in that program is reflective of a much larger increase of farming-related content we're seeing across YouTube around the world. When we dug into the data, we found that uploads of farming-related videos increased 61% in 2019 compared to the same time period a year prior. And views of these videos were keeping pace with that, increasing over 69% in 2019 compared to the same time period a year prior. So I started wondering, what is it that's driving this growth? Why are farmers around the world finding so much breakout success on YouTube? And what I found is that these creators are making videos that are tied to a much larger cultural movement, and they're doing it in ways that are relatable, familiar, and informative. So let's start with that cultural shift. A lot of the trends that we see growing on YouTube are representative of larger societal changes. This is especially true when it comes to ways of living. For example, as housing costs have risen and millennials embrace a more nomadic lifestyle, we've seen a rise in van life videos, where creators vlog about their experiences living in vans around the world. In fact, views of videos with van life in the title surpassed 175 million in 2019 alone. These videos run the gamut from van tours to van buying guides. Similarly, as sustainability has come to the forefront of conversations, we've seen a rise in videos focused on minimalism. So how does an interest in farming intersect with lifestyle shifts? Well, according to a 2018 Gallup poll, 
27% of people said they'd prefer to live in a rural area. That's more than those who said they'd wanna live in a town, a big city, a small city, a suburb of a big city, or a suburb of a small city. This is reinforced when you look at headlines in the media. But there's a gap between aspiration and reality. Even though 27% of people say they'd wanna live in a rural area, only 15% of them do. So what do we do when we wanna live our dreams, but we haven't yet made the leap? We look to see other people who have. And there are plenty of creators who are doing just that on YouTube. This is Jake and Becky Zenda. They started the channel White House on the Hill two years ago. It's since grown to become one of the biggest farming channels in the US with over 400,000 subscribers. When I talked to Jake a couple weeks ago, he told me he wanted to make a lifestyle change that would let him spend more time with his family. He saw a few farming vloggers and thought it looked like something he wanted to try. So his family rented a farm, bought chickens, and started vlogging, learning as they went. Now he says they make most of their living off of YouTube. A few months ago, they had enough money to buy their own farm. Now, this kind of story might sound like one in a million, but it's actually pretty common on YouTube. We see a lot of first-time farmers documenting their move from city to country. What the Farm Girl is a first-gen farmer in Michigan whose vlogs about her life on the farm reach over 49,000 subscribers. Mike Dixon is a former city-living professional bodybuilder turned full-time farmer. And Aaron and Mike of Our Wyoming Life left jobs in corporate America to return to the family ranch. Their video about the cost of haying received over 329,000 views, becoming one of the most viewed farming videos of 2019. If you look at the comments on that video, you see things like, this should be played in every high school to teach economics, math, and just plain life and drove through Wyoming a few years ago, and it was endless fields of hay. I had endless questions that you answered with this video. Thank you. And as a barbecue guy, sometimes videos like this are handy to remind me of the total cost involved with getting quality beef for me to cook. Great video, very interesting, and well presented. Which brings us to the fact that while these channels might pull in audiences who are curious about what that move from city to country is like, they're maintaining them and growing by providing answers to questions that a lot of us might have or not even realize that we have. This is something that's true of channels coming from first time farmers, but also farming creators whose families have been in the industry for generations. On YouTube overall, we continue to see learning content grow. Videos with how-to in the title, for example, had more than 4.2 billion hours of watch time in 2018. This is an area where farming creators have found particular success. If you talk to some first-time farmers who have started their channels, you'll find that a bunch of them found out how to start their channels and how to start their farms from other YouTube channels, one started by multi-generational family farmers. The most popular farming-related video of 2019 came from Zach Johnson, a millennial farmer, who you'll hear from shortly, and it was an educational video. It showed people how to rescue a tractor that had gotten stuck in the mud in a way that was informative and entertaining. That video was viewed over 1.7 million times. Now, Millennial Farmer is a much larger channel within the farming creator community, but we see the appeal of this kind of educational content from smaller creators too. Sass Dutch Kid is a dairy farmer from Saskatchewan who was a recent creator on the rise. He has over 18,000 subscribers. His most popular video is an in-depth 12 minute long look at how to milk cows that's been viewed over 270,000 times. This is incredible, and part of the reason for it is that these aren't just relevant to someone who might be wanting to start a farm of their own. They have much broader relevance, speaking to anyone who's ever wondered where their food comes from in the first place. 
These are things that farming creators are able to address directly with viewers, giving them a firsthand look at everything from the corn harvest, like Meredith Bernard did here, to showing how to raise pigs, like Justin Rhodes did here. The content and information that's being given in these videos is key, but what's also important is how it's being delivered. A lot of farming creators are breaking through and connecting with viewers by using formats that they're already familiar with on YouTube. For example, the majority of farming-related channels on YouTube are vlogs, a style that eliminates the barrier between the creator and their audience, allowing them to speak with them directly. It's an interaction that feels very one-on-one, -on -one, even though in reality, it's not, as the UK-based farmer Tom Pemberton showed here. You feel as if Tom is speaking directly to you, and as a result, that video has been viewed over 450,000 times. But beyond vlogs, we see farming creators experimenting with other trending formats in new and interesting ways. Before this year, if you had asked me what a farming-themed music parody would look like, I don't think I'd have been able to answer you. Then I came across the Peterson Farm Bros, three fifth-generation farming brothers from Kansas, who create two very different kinds of videos. Ones where they offer practical crop harvesting tips, like here, and ones where they perform farming-themed parodies of hit songs. They've also done Ozzy Osbourne's Crazy Train, and a classic YouTube hit, circa 2012, Gangnam Style. That video has been viewed over 17 million times. And while music parodies have been core to YouTube since its early days, by using a well-known format to talk about their industry, the Peterson Farm Bros created an accessible entry point for anyone whether you know something about farming or not. They're parodies, yes, but they're also portraying a day in the life in a fresh and engaging way. The same is true for mukbangs, a trend that originated in Korea but has since spread around the world. This is what a traditional mukbang looks like. It involves sitting at a table and eating copious amounts of food, but it's really defined by its interactivity. Creators typically talk with their audiences or special guests, creating an experience that feels very similar to sharing a meal with them. This might not seem like the most natural format for a farming creator to adapt, but Sandy Brock, the sheep farmer from Canada, did her own clever version of a mukbang, a tractor mukbang. It became a way for her to have a conversation with her audience and to try to be the cool mom to her teenage daughter. Then there are challenge style videos, like this one from How Farms Work, which took a common household appliance into a very unlikely place. And finally, we've even seen reaction videos. These have long been a way that creators have lended their voice to trending moments in pop culture, like reacting to the latest Star Wars trailer. But Ollie of Ollie's Farm adopted this format to lend his voice to a controversial Tesco ad making UK news. Here, he's reacting to news coverage in which they were interviewing a farmer and someone re associated with the ad.
With each of these formats, it's less about what they are and more about what they're doing. They're popular for a reason, and that reason is that they're strengthening the connection between a creator and their audience, whether that's taking them on a tractor ride, chatting about a farming issue in the news, or just going along for a day in the life. At the end of the day, the farming community of creators is growing because they're letting us see life through their eyes. They're informing the broader population and connecting us with us online in ways that have incredibly exciting impact offline. And now I'm so thrilled that we'll get to hear from some of them in person on a panel right after this. Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I, uh, I'm very pleased to announce that I'm gonna get to uh, stick a couple jabs at these very talented people today. Um, my name is Jay Hill. I am a farmer in far west Texas in southern New Mexico. Uh, and I am not big on the YouTube stage, uh, but I happen to have had the opportunity to meet all of these amazing people, and uh, thanks to FBN for giving me the opportunity to give them a hard time. Uh, we've got a little bit of time up here, so what we're going to do is I'm going to go through and have everybody introduce themselves. One of the big things that I want to do is for you guys to go ahead and say when you got started with YouTube, and um, it's okay to, to talk about how you've you've grown a little bit. How many followers do you, or subscribers, should I say, do you have on YouTube? So to start this off, we're going to go to um, God's country. We're going to go to Montana. And uh, I would like to introduce Tony Fast. All right. Um, I farm in Montana, and the YouTube thing was kind of came from Zach and that, well, if people are interested in farming, his way, there's not much about you know farming how we farm in Montana or the crops we grow or that kind of thing. Um, kind of started in April and just kind of wanted to share what the daily life is like on our farm. So you started in April this year, and, and how many subscribers do you have right now? Mm, Eleven thousand something. Okay, Eleven thousand. I'm I'm, I'm going to still have everybody introduce himself, but but do you feel like you're copywriting Zach a little bit? No. Okay, good. I was just <laughs> clearing that air up real quick. Maybe uh, if I had John Deere equipment and red trucks, I don't know. We always have to go to the green and red war. It always has to happen that way. So since we're already in Montana, we might as well just kind of skip on over um, and, and talk to uh, a guy that gives his uh, brother a really hard time. And, uh, and I feel bad for him. <laughs> He's adopted. But... The, the opportunity to get to watch what you guys do and the talent that you have on your farm is absolutely amazing. So, Nick Welker. Hey, everybody. I just, thanks for uh, listening to us speak tonight. I don't know if it's going to be exciting or not, but we're going to do it. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's been a real joy getting to where we're at. Um, nothing could happen if it wasn't for my family and uh, the, just the, the talents that my brother and my father and all of us bring to it. Um, and it's just been an exciting adventure uh, being on social media, on YouTube, and just seeing the reactions that people have. I mean, the kids, the kids are just overwhelming. They just melt your heart and just empower you, makes you just excited and wanting to just produce more for these guys. And, you know, it's just a real pleasure to be here. And, uh, yeah, excited. How many guys are watching you now? Guys and gals, sorry. Um, I think we're about 311,000 now. Give or take. Give or take six yeah. or seven. Okay, yeah, we got that all together. And then <clears throat> we just wanted to make sure that there was a lot of people that were going to be on this panel that that way it was diversified across the country. And we think that it's really important that you put a little butter on it. So we're going to go on to, oh, sorry, Meredith. Um, but somebody that has rose to the occasion, she's glaring at me, um, somebody that's, that's really shown what it's like to be a true farm wife and you show the struggles of what's going on in the house as far as what's going on on the farm and you operate with your husband on the farm. So here's Meredith from North Carolina. I was gonna say that green looks really good on you, but I think it's more jealousy from this, my accent. He really wants my accent. <laughs> okay, anyway. Maybe. <laughs> so um, yeah, I started um, a year and a half or two years ago with a little different than the rest of y'all um, with a silly uh, video making biscuits in my kitchen and <laughs> I have a thing for butter and biscuits and beef and cast iron anyway and then I eventually kind of decided to move 
out on the farm and start doing some videos there and it's just continued to grow and I just find that a lot of people relate to the reel that I show and um, we're definitely different than a lot of these other farms. We're a small farm, smaller. Um, we run a lot of old equipment, but it's been fun to be able to share. Uh, like this year, um, we combined our first corn and beans with our own combine. Our new to us 41 year old F2 gleaner. Any gleaner guys, girls? All right, there's three. Okay, so <laughs> anyway, it was just fun to go through that whole process and I do try to share the good, the bad, the ugly and the, the victories and the, the trials and everything that goes with it and just finding that community out there to be able to share the stories and hear stories from, from you, my viewers has been really fun, so. So the next person that I wanna introduce is, is the first YouTube farmer that I ever watched. Uh, and this guy has, has really jumped in and I mean, just kind of, in my opinion, broke the ice, what it's like to be a, a YouTube sensation. Um, just, I mean, has really done an unbelievable job of what's going on. Ryan, would you please, uh, <laughs> would you please introduce yourself? Yeah, um, Ryan Kister, I'm from Wisconsin, uh, not too far from Zach. And uh, I started doing YouTube in 2012. And at the time, there weren't a whole lot of farming videos on YouTube. And uh, I was in college at the time, and I was thinking, you know, I'd, I'd kind of like to bridge that gap a little bit. And um, I got to thinking, I'm like, you know what? How Farms Twerk is a great name. <laughs> Turns out I had to relabel it, because that didn't work out, as you can probably tell. I had, I, yeah, I think we're all glad that I didn't go with that. I, I feel awkward sitting here now. <laughs> So anyway, um, yeah, I graduated college in 2015 and uh, I started doing YouTube full time. That's when it really took off. And um, it's just been really cool getting out and being able to come to shows like this one and meet everybody. And uh, just being able to talk from everybody from all over the world, um, it really broadens your horizons and you learn a lot. And, uh, and I'm very thankful for the opportunity to come to shows like this and be able to meet people like I have. And then last but not least, <coughs> new to the stage, um, if, you, if you haven't had a chance to watch what Zach does, it's, it's inspiring, it's amazing, and the fact that you can get so much content out of growing corn and soybeans is absolutely amazing to me. Um, but, but in all reality, it's, it's one of those things that I've had the opportunity to know Zach for a couple years now, um, and even though he does bring a, a lot of, of fun, funny content to it too, um, not to take away from anybody on the panel, but he does a lot of spokesmanship too. And as far as as far as really trying to, to better ag and, and and everybody on here does too, and I think that's a testament to you all. But uh, last but not least, Zach Johnson. Uh, my my I'm Zach Johnson, by the way. My uh, channel do. online is uh, the Millennial Farmer or the Minnesota Millennial Farmer, um, and I started in 2016, 100% uh, with the intention of trying to better connect with my sister-in-law, mostly about uh, farming because she was born in Hawaii and then moved to Minneapolis and has never been on a farm until uh, I married my wife and she s seemed to have a lot of opinions and a lot of advice for me as far as uh, what I was doing wrong on my farm. And so uh, that is the complete driving force behind starting my channel and where it's at now was not something that uh, I ever knew was even possible. So it's it's surreal to be sitting up here talking about that uh, three and a half years later. So since you've, you've already got the mic in hand, I'm just going to go ahead and, and pass the ball back into your court and say, how are you handling, and, and it's, it's a weird context for us to all talk about, but at the same time, you guys are extremely popular in the ag world right now. A lot of people know who you are, and, 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 and more people by the day are starting to know who you are and what you do. How has that stardom affected your family life? Uh, for me personally, it keeps me pretty busy. Um, last year, especially when I say last year, I guess I talk about over the winter because I'm far enough north where uh, like this time of year, things get pretty slow. I don't have 200 different crops like Jay does. Um, and I have to wear a coat a lot of the year, which is not fair for, for us up north. But uh, so over the winter, I was really busy. I did a lot of traveling, a lot of speaking, um, traveled some just to try and, and make content with other farms about what goes on on other farms besides just my own uh, and it kept me really busy this year I'm actually 
uh, I'm turning down a lot of things just to stay home and go to the hockey tournaments and the Christmas programs and whatever else is going on because I have three young kids. And so um, as busy as last year got, I mean, it just kind of got out of control. You know, you, you say yes to one thing and then another email comes and you say yes to that. And pretty soon you're looking at your Google calendar on your phone because that's what we do, unless you have an iPhone, I suppose. But it, pretty soon it's full and you miss a lot of stuff. And so uh, I'm trying to be home a lot more this year, but but still try and get out there and try to do the best I can with managing it, I guess. And I, I guess there's, to, to continue on with that, Nick, you just recently welcomed a new one to the family. And so how does, I mean, and you have a brother that's on the channel with you quite a bit. I mean, how does how does dinner work? Do you guys sit down and talk about what's happening in your social life or is it farm talk? You know, prior to YouTube, it, it was a lot of farm talk. I mean, that's just pretty typical. The wives can't really get around that one and try, but it's kind of a battle. It just seems like it never is lost. But um, when YouTube entered the scene, especially in the past year, yeah, it's, it's, it's a common conversation. I mean, at dinner, at night, when the kids are in bed, in the morning. I mean, it's, it's kind of like the... It's that's an, <laughs> that's enough of Welker. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Someone does not like what I'm saying. Uh, it's just kind of the unforeseen consequence of being, I don't want to say popular, but I guess wanted through all these different venues. And uh, you just be, you get consumed. And I've, I've really felt like it has been tough to put focus back into my family and my kids. I mean, I, it's, it's a struggle to sit down at the table. Because a lot of times I'm working hard all day. I've had a camera. I'm trying to get work done while I'm doing this. And the last thing I've done is posted on Instagram, Twitter, Discord, you know, YouTube community, emails, whatever it may be. So the one time I get after working is sitting down at the table. But that's a huge no-no. Right. You know, I need to have that phone down. And I need to eat and talk to my kids and my wife. And so it's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. And I find myself sometimes getting into that. And I got to go, nope, down. Know. And so it's it's amazing that the benefits and, and the blessings and the opportunities that we've come into have been enormous. And I don't ever want to say that I am not thankful, but it is a struggle with the family, the young family too. With this new baby, it's been a lot of a lot of sleepless nights and a, a lot of decisions to make. And it's you know we press on, and especially after hearing last night's story, I mean, you just know that <laughs> someone else has always got it harder. So it's not like I can really say that I'm in a poor situation we're pretty thankful to be where we're at so and then ryan with you you, you travel a lot i mean i've seen you or you you were traveling a lot and i recently haven't kept up with you a whole lot but at the same time i see that you know you you set up a booth and you you've done a really good job of marketing yourself you still are a part of a family operation uh, and we see your family on the farm how does how, has it changed the dynamics of how you work with your family uh, definitely. Um, and I'm blessed to have a brother on the farm full time that's able to take care of things for me today, especially because I've got a cow that's out right now and hopefully that's being handled. <laughs> but yeah, as far as like traveling and stuff, I mean, it's really gotten difficult trying to manage where you're going to be and, you know, how to plan things around when things are going on around the farm because I want to be there for, I want to be present on the farm. I want to, you know, I want to participate all the time. I mean, I'm, that's why I have to kind of be careful with when I schedule events and I have to watch, you know, when hay, hay making season's going on, when's harvest going on. And I was actually pretty worried that I wasn't going to be able to make it to this one because of harvest, which just ended about a week ago. So, Congratulations on finishing harvest. It must be nice. Um, <laughs> to, to, to bounce down to Meredith, your husband is not on social media. Am I correct? No. No. Absolutely not. Right. You homeschool both of your kids. I homeschool my kids. He's not, yeah, he would still have a flip phone if he could. He hates it. So, <laughs> but he's coming around. He's coming around to it. The more I share the comments, you know, if I share with him, maybe not the bad comments, but the good, <laughs> the good comments. And, um, yeah, there's still times if I'm, you know, like the summer when it was 100 degrees and he was trying to fix the combine and I was up in his face with the camera. <laughs> I have to, I just have to edit a lot. <laughs> People say, we want to follow your husband around all day. I'm like, I, I, I couldn't do that. <laughs> it, it just wouldn't work. Do you, do you feel that but. it's changing the way that your kids look at you and the technology and, and, and the yeah, new age? Yeah, I think so. Um, but I mean, they're handling it well. I think my, in fact, they've gotten more involved. Like I can tell they don't mind being on the camera as much. My girl is 
well, she's ready to be a rock star, you know. <laughs> she loves having her, doing her own videos and stuff now, too. So, um, I don't know. I think it's also kind of made me more aware. And the more that I take on being, I am a farm wife, but I'm also, I do consider myself a farmer because I'm right there with them, helping and learning. And um, since I'm showing other people, I feel like it makes me pay more attention and learn more too. I'm asking more questions about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And my husband is patient and he teaches, you know, so I, I kind of like that aspect too. And then Tony, you're, I mean, a devout family man. You got your sweetheart Amy in the crowd in, this afternoon. And, and a lot of what I see, and at least especially on Instagram too, you know, I see the girls are a part of, of what you do a lot, you know, um, and everybody here. I mean, you see family that's involved in, in what's going on. As you have, since you're probably the, you're the newest adapter of, of getting onto YouTube, what what struggles do you see in the family element as as you start to have people that are, are following along? It's definitely a time consumer and trying to balance when you spend time editing and putting it all together when you need to be spending family time and putting, like, I don't try to use the... Like, don't put the girls in the video to try and use them or anything, but it's like they're part of the farm, mm -hmm. and that part's, like, enjoyable for me to share what I'm doing, but then balancing when I get in the house that I'm not doing, you know, try to stay off my phone, try to stay off my phone, and, you know, wait until the right time to work on this stuff. So one of the biggest things, too, is, and if any of you out there share your opinion on social media, um, it's one of those, it's a, it's a double-edged sword where we, where we post something that we believe in, that we put our, our, our thought process and our faith into, and then we get reactions from people that might not agree with us, haters, and, uh, haters going to hate. But at the same time, the biggest thing that we see is, is how do you handle, and, and I'm going to bounce this over to Nick real quick. How do you handle negative comments? You know, to be frank, I haven't fully figured that out yet. I mean, honestly, it's 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 getting to be. I, I'm a very sensitive person, believe it or not. Um, I've, I actually I, tissues, please. <laughs> I'm, I'm very personal. I, I, I enjoy people. I'm, I'm very sensitive feelings, um, and it's hard to take criticism, especially when you poured hours, hundreds of hours, money, time. You're working. You're doing something you've done for generations that you're parents have done for generations, that your family's on, that your neighbors do, and then you get criticized for it. And it's hard. It's hard to take feedback because it's so easy for someone to type something in, and in, you know how text messages go. Stuff can be misinterpreted. They might not have even been in that intent of upsetting you, but it just can come across the wrong way. And it's, it's, I've learned, honestly, to build up a little bit of callous and to try to just say, you know what, I just, this isn't, why am I ignoring the 30 people that say, we love what you do? And focusing on the one person that says, you know, yada, yada, yada. yada. And it's, it's hard, too, because a lot of people just don't understand. I mean, you can't, a camera, I mean, I thought Zach was, like, five feet tall. And now I found out he's, like, five inches taller than me, you know. Like, you can't, the perspective from a camera does not genuinely show what is truly going on. Yeah, I thought you were taller. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's hard to give the audience a real view of what we're doing. They don't see all the stuff behind the camera that's taking place. So their perspective of whatever you're doing that they're criticizing, and, and, and then that's the hard part too, is you wanna, you wanna tell them why. So then you write up this long thing and you spend like 15 minutes perfectly grammaring so they don't criticize you on that. You know, spelling, so they don't <laughs> criticize you on your spelling. Everything you could possibly do to try to tell this person why we do that this way only to have them respond with something else. And I've just, it's learned it's not worth it. Most of the time, too, I've seen people like that, you know, and when, when I'll get somebody that's kind of on the hate mail side of things, that I'll type out some long response and my wife will come by and hit the delete button, just let it be. You know, and I'm like, oh. You, Meredith, have kind of an interesting, I guess, I wouldn't say haters, but more admirers, um, where people see that you're, young and blonde and beautiful and people tend to reach out to you in that, that regard. And so how does that affect the relationship with your husband and how does that affect the way that you respond to people that are obviously have the wrong intention? Well, it really does 
Well, since he's not on social media, he doesn't know. I just delete it and we're done with that. <laughs> so don't anybody tell him. No. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I struggle with the negative comments, too, because I'm also pretty sensitive. I just want to crawl in a hole and cry. I do. I cry a lot, actually. I cry on camera. I'm not going to cry right now. Thank you for um, keeping it together. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm learning. I've. I just, I'm learning to try to grow some thicker skin and delete what needs to be deleted, block if they need to be blocked, and, but remind myself, just like you said, there's 300 amazing comments of encouragement, you know, we love what you're doing, thank you, this is like great entertainment for our kids and our grandkids, and we watch you, and, and then letting that, letting the negative just go. Zach, you've got people that are making fake accounts now that are acting like you. They actually said that it would be better to watch or to eat glass than to watch me. So thanks for your haters rolling on over to, to my. You're welcome. Thing. You're yes. such a, and thank you what for a letting giver. everybody know that those are all there so they can go subscribe and follow them. <laughs> so anyways, Zach, uh, <laughs> how are you dealing with that? You're at a point now where you've got people that are making false accounts trying to sabotage what you've worked so hard to what, what, what's your, I mean, what do you do? Uh, I, I, what can you do? I mean, I, if you engage with it, you're just going to feed it. So, I mean, we've got hundreds of thousands of views. Obviously, somebody likes what we're doing. Um, we've got people sitting here. There are probably people sitting out here. No doubt there's people sitting out here who don't like what we're doing. But, I mean, if you think about it, it it's like you say, there's 300 good comments and one bad one. And... Why spend the time and energy on one bad comment instead of the other 300 that are good, right? I mean, you heard Marcus Luttrell talk a, a lot last night about, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you do nothing, then, then nobody's going to say anything bad about you, right? I mean, in order, unfortunately, uh, haters are just a, a byproduct of success, I guess is the way I look at it. There's nothing you can do other than ignore it, turn it off. I feel like you just burned them really bad with that comment. That's quotable. That was good. I want to I want to take a minute just because I didn't get to the haters mail on the two of you, but what I want to ask is what's the future? I mean, you guys you you've already built an empire on on YouTube, but you're still building an empire. So what's the future? What does this do? What's your hopes with agriculture? What's your hopes with your YouTube channel? What what is, you know, what is the red carpet going to where's it going to lead you? Really the biggest thing that I want to get out of YouTube is really just to educate the public. It's not really about me. Um, what do you want to educate? What, what, do you, what do you want them to know? I want to bridge that disconnect between farmers and the consumer. And I feel like showing my everyday life, the ins, out, ins and outs of it, I do have a lot of far followers who aren't farmers themselves, but who are just fascinated by the lifestyle. And I think it's important that we maintain that connection there because a lot of things can be misinterpreted or looked at the wrong way. and. Uh, by making sure that there's a, that discussion, then uh, I think that's really going to lead to the success or continued success of agriculture. Tony, people will get on your video and they say they see these gigantic air seeders and these quad tracks rolling over the hill, and you're you're you got these beautiful large combines, you know, threshing wheat or I don't understand combine lingo, um, but at the same time, how do you relate your message to the person that's going to go to a grocery store and buy a loaf of bread? How do you bridge that gap? I'm new to this, so I'm learning, but that's kind of the goal. Like, we need to take what we're doing and share it with the world and tell our story, but not let somebody else tell it for us. So, I don't know, like, it's new enough to me that, like, it's good that we have this group and others that we talk with, and if someone's success successful at that, that we can all kind of work together in sharing that in some sort. I think, I think one thing too is when you look at, at kind of the, the direction, we're all tied to YouTube and Meredith, you might be kind of out, but still when you were, when you were working on your Gleaner Combine, Gurney or Gertie or whatever your name of your combine is, what was it? Gertie, excuse me. I got through, Gertie. <laughs> um, but if, if you look at it, we're tied to it through, through machinery. And what really drives us, because farmers, I mean, let's face it, it's cool to get into something new or it's cool. I've never really watched a Big Bud. You know, I've never seen one in person. But to watch you guys completely restore one, to watch you try John Deere's newest, latest, and greatest, to watch Tony put up two-mile-long runs of alfalfa, I mean, to watch you with a new teleskid and do all this stuff, machinery kind of binds it. And it's one of those things that 
it gives us a common ground. But how do we get away from just talking about how cool, big, fancy, shiny, efficient, uh, sustainable we do that? How do you get somebody that is not in agriculture to say, hey, this is pretty cool? And Zach, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with this. I look at what you post on Instagram, and I look at it, and when you post a picture of a tractor, it just goes berserk. I mean, it's like 10,000 likes right over, off the bat, but then you post something that's like snow and a sunset, which in my mind, I'm like, that's really pretty. You get half of the likes. So how do you get, the, how do you get your followers to say, okay, we, we, where do you bridge that gap, should I say? I, that's something that I'm, you know, I think we're all trying to figure that out too, but I, in the end, I mean, if you're reaching farmers, if you're reaching anybody any way, then they'll get to see that you're a person, no matter how fancy or shiny the machinery is, right? And, and if you have if you have the machinery there to, to bring the people in and get them to hit the like button and get them to follow you, and then you back that up with a snowy sunset or your daughter doing something funny or whatever, you, you show yourself as a person, even if they don't hit the like button, there's still, you know, 100,000 people that saw that. Yeah, I don't like all your photos, but I look at them. I don't like you that much either, Jay. I know. Especially that coat. Guy, you guys want to chime in on that too? And, and we're going to open the floor up for, we're going to have time for two quick questions too after. So if you guys will kind of say, how are you going to try to move your channel towards a non-ag base? How are you going to do it? Well, real quick with our channel, I, I think one thing that we've attempted to try, which is a lot more effort and, and expensive, is, is to try to bring your production value higher so it kind of matches what you would see on a, a TV station and sometimes people like that some people don't uh, but I feel like if someone doesn't know a lot about egg but the video is enjoyable like it just kind of either it's the music the the cinematic aspects of the, the photography the videography um, and how it flows if that can catch their attention then maybe maybe they'll start to look at the actual content and be like wow that's that's actually what are they doing there you know what why are they changing those points on that that air drill or, or what what's you know what's the reason why um, that tractor's got eight tires on it, you know, it just, just, just kind of get the mind working a little bit and hopefully, and thanks to, you know, YouTube search stuff that they can look in then and look at Ryan's content or, or Tony's or Meredith or Zach or, 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 or there's a plentiful amount of YouTubers out there that have great content, great ag content. And if they can get them in that, then the stories can start being told. And that's just one perspective that we've taken. I don't know if it's the right way because we're still learning, but. Yeah. Ryan? I've been trying to think of an answer to this one. Um, I would have to say that I probably take the nerdy approach, and I try to sprinkle in like scientific facts. Like I try to talk like about like how plants actually, you know, produce chlorophyll and stuff like that. I try to sprinkle those kind of like random facts throughout my videos to try to uh, let people walk away with something. And I feel like if they walk away with some you know cool little facts, that they can go and tell their friends like, hey, did you know that uh, the reason that plants are green is because they reflect all light except for the green? So I think things like that are pretty cool. Um, that's try to, how I try to branch my audience a little bit. Um, one thing I found is that your followers are often going to be people who are just like you and they can connect with you. So no matter what you do, I feel like if someone's looking for enjoyable content, as long as you're putting it out there in, you know, you're making a reasonable effort to broaden your, broaden your reach, I should say. Um, I think they're going to find you. That's a good answer. Meredith, Tony? Um, I don't know. I'm very different than both of what you just said. I'm very low-tech, and I'm definitely not a nerd. Maybe a dork, but I'm not a nerd. <laughs> um, so I guess the way I approach it is, you know, I don't use the high-tech stuff. I've been able to do what I do with just my phone and editing it on, you know, regular editing equipment on my computer that I taught myself. And But I, the feedback I get from my viewers is that they appreciate that. They like the real, they like the off-the-cuff, and, you know, nothing's ever staged or scripted. And it's just me taking my phone around and... You know, showing what I'm doing during the day and like somebody just came up to me today and said I don't even really know why I like watching you but I do <laughs> I don't know why I'm watching you go to the Piggly Wiggly and then come home and feed the cows <laughs> and make supper but it's entertaining and relaxing and I don't know so I guess that's the cool thing though is that we're all 
we're all, we are all different. There is room for everybody at the table or the trough, as I say. And, we, you know, we're all, we all reach different people. And um, so. Fast egg, as they say in Montana. Isn't that the right way? To yeah, a flag pole. Is, is it still on? Okay. How are you bridging the gap? I don't know. Like, that's... That's hard to figure out. You can go look at all the analytics and stuff from the YouTube side and try and figure out what in that video made that one do what it did. And like, it's, it's, there's no textbook to this. Like, you just make a video that you think is gonna be okay and then it might be your best video that's out there. And the one that you're really excited about, there's a flop. Like, it's just, it's weird. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason to some of it. And, just trying to figure that out is, ask us in a couple of years maybe, okay. I don't know. Maybe these guys have figured out like the niche to it, but. We've got to double down. Well, if you think about the, the number of views that we get, I mean, all of us up here, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot, right? Hundreds of thousands on a lot of our videos or over a million on some of them. And I, I've actually tried to figure out how many are farmers and how many are not. So I've put polls on several of my videos. And usually on my videos, I would guess it's different for all of us, but on my videos, the response is about 40% non-farmers. Well, my channel in November, because November's my biggest month, it's, it's harvest, and I had over 10 million views in November. So I reached, you could say, about 4 million non-farmers with those views. I mean, you could say I'm still reaching more farmers than I am non-farmers. But I'm still reaching a lot of non-farmers. And the, the other thing is that when, when I go to events like this, and Nick touched on it earlier, the amount of kids that come up and love watching us. And then Jay talks about machinery. You don't have to be a farm kid to like machinery. Every kid likes machinery. So you draw those kids in with the machinery, the next thing they know, they're living in downtown Chicago and they're watching a farmer from Montana plant peas. And then they watch another one and another one. And then pretty soon that brings them to a guy in Wisconsin who's harvesting corn. And then to the other farmer in Montana. And, and it just, it cycles. And pretty soon these kids are watching these videos and whether or not they're going to grow up to be a farmer or not, in a, in a way that we don't even realize, I think, they're still connecting to farmers. They're still out there. So they're still seeing our stuff. So I think that's a huge reason why we also got to keep it positive because they are out there. I'd say 40% is pretty successful. Yeah, you've if even all, us, of all of our channels get to 40%, we're doing our, what we're going out to do. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's substantial. So we're going to take two questions real quick, but before we take the two questions and make them, I mean, make them sweat. hit them. <laughs> um, but before we do those two questions, just a simple yes or no, do you have any political aspirations ahead of you? Tony? Do you, are, you, are you thinking about running down into the poli political realm at some point in your career? No. Meredith? Big fat no. Yeah, I don't think so. You know, I, life is very unpredictable. So, yes. I'm running. <laughs> this is, here's your Let's first run. yes. <laughs> I still can get in the race, right? Oh, no. I have to be 42. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, so I, he left that door wide open. I already did three years on the township board as a local officer, so my time in politics is over. <laughs> All right. Okay, questions? We're, okay, we got one. So the question, if y'all y'all didn't hear, he's asking, what about expansion as far as other social media platforms? And and I think everybody here utilizes you know multiple social media platforms. But do you think it's important? If I'm summarizing this correctly, do you think it's important that you continue to look at the new platforms that are coming online and making sure that you have a viable presence on those? All of you, fast. I think it is definitely important that we constantly try to gain new audience and branch out to different platforms. 
Um, I actually just started a TikTok a couple weeks ago, and I'm still learning the ropes on it. But um, yeah, there's definitely an audience to reach that's on there. I think that's definitely one of the more up and coming platforms. Um, and it wouldn't say it was necessarily going to re replace YouTube by any means because of the type of videos they are, but it's just another platform, kind of like Vine. Anybody else have anything that's kind of along those lines? I started a Snapchat a year ago because for that reason, to try and reach the younger crowd, and everybody told me I needed to be on Snapchat, and I couldn't stand it. Um, and and uh, this probably will surprise a lot of people, but honestly, I don't enjoy social media that much. I I started it to bridge the gap and, and connect with people, but in the end, I spend enough time on there that I didn't enjoy being on another platform. Um, so I, it's still floating out there, but I haven't been, I haven't logged on since February. Um, I've been told a lot lately that I need to get TikTok, and I have zero interest in that. I'd rather go back on the township board. <laughs> you guys have anything? Yeah, I, it's, yeah. I, I've, I've actually cut back on some of my other platforms. I mean, I used to do a lot on Discord, and I've, I've cut back on that. I mean, it's just, there's only so much time in my day. And that's what's all right, great about Instagram is you can post on there and it'll share it to Facebook as well because they're parent company owned. And so I try as hard as I can to find how to streamline and minimize the amount of effort it takes for me to do what I'm doing so that then I can focus on the real important things in my life like my family and the farm. Um, and it's a fine balance. And so the idea of bringing on another platform is not very appealing. It, it depends. Plus, I've also heard that TikTok was developed and created by a certain country on their side of the planet that... Yeah. Trade war. Yeah. <laughs> so it's owned by, yeah, there's, there's some questionable things about that one too, so I'm not so excited to jump on board. But yeah, I, I, as long as the platforms right now allow us to do what we want to do, and we've got the audience, I'm content to stick with that. But I do know there's tech is just constantly, constantly flip-flopping and finding new directions to go. And if we're smart, we will watch it and, and carefully and thoughtfully take the direction that we feel, you know, it's best for the platform. Y'all have anything to add to that? I don't really think I could add anything to that. <laughs> I'm not on TikTok. I just deleted my Snapchat. I'm just kind of the same way. I'm trying to maintain what I've got because the larger it gets, the harder it gets to maintain and much less continue to create content and still get life done. So, Tony? I think there's got to be a limit to how much time you spend on it and being involved in three or four if you count YouTube as the fourth one already like if you can't get your message out in those ones then you probably shouldn't be getting your message out or there isn't a message to get out maybe but there's a lot of these platforms have come and go on already like Vine like is that even around anymore I mean that was a pretty big thing you can you can still six like, years ago yeah or you can follow me on my MySpace. That's another good one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> good spot to be. Do we have one more question? Tim Hall. Oh, was I supposed to say his name out loud? No. Oh, sorry. Hi, Tim. Welcome. Quick question. Uh, would anybody want to comment about monetizing your videos? Has that changed your farm, the way you operate, your motivation towards actually doing some of this stuff? Are you... And I, I, yeah, so, so Tim's talking about monetizing things and, and not to get in the weeds with that subject, but at the same time, I mean, we're seeing equipment dealers bringing things out, partnerships happening, things like that going on. Is that something, is the, is the money side, is the, is the partnership side something that is encouraging you to keep that as a viable business, or is it still more based off of social? Am I, am, is that okay? All right. He, shaked, he said yes. Fire away. I, I ran my channel and did my thing online for a year and a half before I ever knew that I could make any money on it. Uh, I knew that there were YouTubers making money. Uh, I had no idea how much it was and I didn't figure that I would ever be one of them. So when I had a couple videos take off and I started making money, uh, I had a real dilemma in my head about whether or not that means that am I still being a voice for the farmer or am I now trying to make money off of this? And I guess to me, it's, it's a little of both. Um, if, if I don't make money off of it, then I will go back to making one video every one or two weeks and, and it will be a hobby of mine and half of them won't be edited because I'm not going to sit down and spend the several hours to edit them. Um, so the money is a motivator and a driver, but it's also a way to justify 
the time that I spend on it, and, and then beyond that, it, it helps grow the channel because you're going to spend more time on it if your time is being paid for. So I guess it's kind of a, a roundabout way of saying it, but if, if there's money there to be made, it's an incentive to continue and go on, which also means you're going to reach more people. Yeah, I mean, it's to, to, to pretend that, that, that financially that's not a motivator. I mean, it's just obviously not right. I mean, the, the, the income originally was like, man, if I could just make just enough, just enough to buy one camera, you know, then I wouldn't have to be on my own pocket. I kind of justify this a little bit. And then it's like, oh, I, I was able to buy a computer that I can edit with and improve this. And then drones, drones aren't cheap. I mean, and to be able to buy a drone, and that brings a whole other perspective to the scene. And then a 360 camera, and then, oh, my brother, He's great. I would like to have him on a camera. I got to get him another camera gear, and then batteries for that, and then SD cards for that. And you wonder why they always fire the brother. Yeah, he's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and he wants to fix everything, and that costs a lot too. Uh, leg arms. And, and so, I mean, and then you got, I mean, for myself, I, I've got subscriptions to Epidemic Sound and Art List, and those are 15 bucks a month here, 15 bucks a month there. Uh, um, Adobe Premiere editing software, that's like a hundred and some bucks, 200 bucks a year. Uh, there is a Dropbox, I gotta subscribe to Dropbox because I need a, a, a cloud to upload my videos for the editors. I gotta pay editors. I've got a, I've got a huge, I, I've actually, I mean, I've got a pretty big, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? I've, I've got expenses that have to be made to make this work. Otherwise, I just have to take a massive step back. And people were on me early on. Like, we want more videos. We want more videos. Two, three videos a year is not going to cut it. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to record throughout the year, spend 40 hours editing a video, upload it, and then go to the next year. And what drove me to produce two videos a week was because financially it made it worth my time. And honestly, anybody out here, if you had the opportunity to bring in another stream of revenue, especially in the industry that ag is in today, you would jump on it especially if you can do it while you're farming. If you can make money while you're working, it's kind of a no-brainer. But money is always controversial. The motivation behind it's always controversial. And we just always have to try to make sure that, and, and that's the thing is I believe all of us here, we're always carefully listening and watching and willing to try to make the changes necessary so that it doesn't get out of control. Ryan? Kind of like what these two said, I think we can, all of us up here can attest to the fact that if there wasn't a financial side to it, we couldn't justify the amount of time that we put into YouTube. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, just the time in editing is two full time, makes it two full time jobs, including the farm. I mean, the first half of doing YouTube is super easy because you can just set up the camera and away we go on the tractor. You know, you pick the camera back up 15 minutes later, no problem. But then uh, it's definitely, I mean, I spend probably three to four nights a week. Uh, after I get home from the farm working on videos. And I would have to say that, you know, if there wasn't that financial motivator there, I would go back to doing it like I was back in college, which is, you know, once, twice, maybe three times a month. And um, probably just try to kind of go at it a little, little bit slower because I wouldn't be able to afford that time to be able to. It'd be a hobby. Yeah, it would, it would be a hobby, absolutely. Meredith? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a whole lot more to add. I was the same way when I started. I didn't know that I really could make any money, never expected to. I mean, I was like, I told my husband, if I can make enough to buy some coffee, you know, <laughs> that'd be awesome, a cup of coffee. But um, so, yeah, when I did start making a little bit, and of course, my channel is not huge, but I mean, it, it is making an impact. It's, it's definitely now like an added income for our family. And I don't take that for granted. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's helping put groceries on the table and gas in the truck. Um, so, and I definitely want to be responsible with that. But yeah, it's a motivator. But it also, like you say, is a, a way of making it, um, what was the word, to make it make sense to be able to, to continue putting the time into it. And, and since I started making a little bit of money, it helps my husband be okay with me yeah. being in his space. It helps, it helps him understand that whole side. <laughs> yeah. and, then, yeah. and then Tony. I had no idea what was even possible when I started as far as like the financial side. I heard, you know, there's ads on and you can get paid from whatever, but like, I didn't know if that was, like what levels it took to even before you could even achieve that. So I wouldn't say it was like for the money or anything like that, but the money does make it possible or, you know, worth it in your time in the end, I guess. 
Well, that's, I, I'm pretty sure we've gone way over our time. I'm sorry. Um, but I wanted to say, just for me as a, kind of an outsider, I, I want to say thank you to everything that you guys do. Because it, not only is it enjoyable when I've been home and sick and not feeling good, I've watched all your videos. But at the same time, thank you for, for becoming the new voice of agriculture. And I think that's what we all here are looking for. That's why we're here today is we're looking for what is going to drive us in a direction that's going to be positive, that we are reaching the end consumer, that they understand why you grow corn and soybeans and how that impacts, impacts somebody that's in downtown New York City. So on behalf of myself, and, and I know a lot of people here share the sentiment, thank you. And, and lastly, last but not least, um, everybody that's up here is going to be over by the Plinko board. So please come by, say hi. Um, very human people, no robots up here. So it's nice to see people come up and say hi. So maybe Zach, we don't know if this is his alter, alternative, alternative. It's the actor, it's the, actor yeah. the plays millennial farmer. Um, but but run by, say hi, shake their hand, um, and then if you got tips, tricks, or if you guys ever think about starting, you know, reach out to these people. And they can't say that they can respond to you because you probably get so many messages a day, anyways. Um, but with that, thank you to YouTube, thank you to FBN for, for hosting this event, and uh, God bless you all.